Welcome everybody uh, to a lecture that is going to cover, uh, at least in this little version that I have here of the book, I imagine they're all quite similar, uh, is uh, the first about 84 pages here. So it's actually, I, I am going to be covering a good chunk of the book. Uh, and that only leaves about roughly 20 pages. Uh, for those of us that have read this book before, we know, you know everything's important up until the end of this uh, novel by John Steinbeck, uh, but a lot has taken place, uh, obviously, before that as well. So that's really what I'll be covering here. I don't want to waste too much time uh, with kind of, you know, uh, background here. I, I do have some slides prepared just to give some kind of visual overlay to uh, the bigger kind of topics that I'll be covering uh, that are kind of based on this reading. I'm going to definitely go chronological through the pages and, and, and try to go quite quick as well since there's a lot to cover and time is uh, uh, kind of slim. I hope everyone's doing well with the coronavirus and the quarantine taking place. Uh, I hope everyone is healthy and staying safe. So we start people where, without giving too much of a spoiler here, we will end, uh, which is um, a kind of creek, uh, a pool. It's really described, I think, at least in my opinion, and I've read a good amount uh, of Steinbeck as kind of a paradise. Uh, perfect within nature, uh, um, uh, uh, something to be cherished about uh, the organic deep greens that are kind of uh, uh, described here. There's also this idea, just like you would find in nature, of the cycles, uh, running through all the cycles, right? Uh, willows fresh and green with every spring. So um, just as much of, uh, of what we could say as a part of nature is that ever going cycle, that things just continue. And I think that's a, an interesting theme to think about once this story's uh, events have run their full course to come back and think, is this a cycle? Uh, is this just like life kind of going on and going through the ups and downs and curves of what is natural life? Something to think about. So, and what pops into this almost like it belongs, but at the same time kind of out of nowhere is these two men, uh, George and Lenny. Um, I think it is important uh, to remember some of the ideas that we have to keep in mind early on is this idea of friendship right between these two men uh, within the first 40 pages you know we can start to ask these questions what do you make of george and lenny's friendship and i i, I, I do use that uh, sarcastically because i think some of us wouldn't really classify this as a, a great friendship especially when you see the way that george treats lenny also when you start to think about the troubles that Lenny's behaviors do present, uh, that's not a great thing to do to a friend either, is make them always have to get you out of jams and uh, you know bad situations uh, that you've gotten yourself into and you're kind of dragging other people in to help you out. That's not a great way to treat a friend as well. So they might both have some fault uh, when we think about what constitutes a good friendship. I also think when you Take a serious, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, when you start to think about a, a friendship, you also realize that these guys are good friends. Uh, I, and that's why I put up here mutual dependency, uh, which means they definitely depend on each other. Um, I think in very obvious ways you can start to think in your mind how Lenny depends on George, uh, especially because of his, because of his uh, let's say disabled status. Uh, it's, it's never given to us exactly what uh, Lenny is de uh, dealing with. Uh, it could be mental retardation. It could be uh, autism on the spectrum, perhaps. It could be something different. It could be something that even Steinbeck, only he knows in his mind because he really doesn't provide, let's say, uh, a diagnosis, right? Or something that is uh, 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 clearly stated uh, in the text. Um, but it makes for definitely a disadvantage in uh, uh, situations and George has to get him out of it. We learn about it. The earliest uh, kind of account is, is something that happened in a town called Weed. Maybe there's some symbolic value to that. I'll leave that up to you for the time being. But that's where Lenny looks like he grabbed onto a girl's skirt and just for the fabric, he wanted the touch of it and he wouldn't let go. Um, and that's what got them into a big 
uh, into a lot of trouble and they had to flee the town, right? Basically ran out. And here they are now showing up in this different area uh, looking for work. And that's where we go to this, this final idea here is this, this common dream. I want to think about that as we move forward is the common dream these two men share. Uh, what is that common dream? It's described. It's one of the most memorable things I think anybody reading this book takes, takes away from it is that recitation uh, of the dream over and over. Le George, you tell it. Uh, come on, Lenny, you know it. You tell it. No, George, you got to tell it. And so we're constantly being uh, uh, told the dream over and over again in this small uh, novel. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, all right, so ba back to uh, what we have here. Another thing I, I just want to highlight here in the beginning few pages is... Lenny being described really in many different ways as an animal. Let's look at the two names that we have here, and even that comes to distinguish one from the other. Uh, Lenny is described thoroughly as an animal here, from the way he drinks the water like a horse, his big hands being described as like bear paws, which is on page two, uh, dragging his feet a little, the way a bear drags his paws. He's not only given, let's say, the basic animal quality of being an animal, but also the kind of force uh, and the ferocity, I guess you could say, and just the magnitude of that animal. I mean, you think about when a bear eats, what that must look and, and sound like. When you talk about a horse drinking a, a full amount of water from a pool, you talk about the force behind that, right? These are big animals. These are beasts, and Lenny is described in that way. Uh, another thing I want to uh, 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 touch upon here quickly uh, is the names. I was just going to mention that. Lenny translates, Lenny is probably a form of Le uh, Leonard or Leo or Leonardo. And Leo, as you all know, you think about like the signs and stuff, is lion. And so when you look up the name of Lenny or, or Leo, you're really talking about like a, a prideful lion and the pride that kind of comes with the idea of that animal. Uh, so uh, that's Lenny. Now, George uh, actually uh, translates to farmer or earth worker. And I'm pretty sure that Steinbeck chooses that name very purposefully, maybe for a couple of reasons. One is that's exactly what George is in this book and Lenny as well. And many of the other characters that we come across, they are earth workers. They are farmers, which you got to remember when we talk about ancient history, some of you will grow up to be lawyers. Some of you will grow up to be teachers, professors. Some of you will grow up to be this, that, and the next, right? Work in marketing, whatever it's going to be. Um, but remember, when we talk about ancient history, a lot of occupations were basically just farmers, right? Uh, especially because populations weren't so great. You know, there was probably more than enough work to go around. Um, so there's the translation. And I think for other reasons, it's really just your common man. Because this really used to be the occupation when we think in broader terms, more historic terms. I think George is in a way there to represent your everyday worker, right? Just your everyday kind of man. Not gonna be perfect, maybe not gonna be completely awful, maybe somewhere in the middle, and I'd love to see what some of those thoughts are eventually through assignments and discussion boards, uh, but that's what George translates to, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's quite purposeful, right? Okay. Now, um, I'm gonna, highlight that idea once again because it's something that sticks with me as much as we go through this story and it's always Lenny who is saying tell me the dream over and over and over again George uh, uh, just just tell it and then George is like dude you know it right y you know it so well you're like hanging on every word and you can almost like spit it out before I even say it but it's something about Lenny needing George to say it right so I think that's a, a great Analysis, uh, analysis. I think that's a great interpretation. But I think it's also further, I think George needs to hear it more and more and more. Because that's one of the questions, and uh, I think this leads us to the next slide. Well, let me go over here real quick. Uh, chasing dreams, this common dream for them, which is to have a, it's a wonderful dream, a piece of property of their own. Not have to work on someone's property only to make the money to kind of sustain yourself just for that moment, only to have to move on to this guy's property and make him richer and never have something that you can pull back from all that work every day of your life and say, this is mine. I can use this to 
uh, help kind of secure my future and more of, a, uh, of my dream, right? Instead of just always just adding to what all these employers have. As these men, and George and Lenny are just one of many, many, many thousands of men doing this, right? Uh, going from ranch to ranch to ranch in this uh, itinerant way, right? From place to place. Um, we'll get back to this slide uh, in just a minute. I just wanted to mention that uh, that shared dream is obviously a big part uh, of their friendship. How much does that dream mean to George? That's what I want us all thinking about as we keep on moving forward here, right? Now, the page is about six through eight here. We get into one of Lenny's fixations, which is to, to need a soft thing to hold on to and kind of pet. And I think the petting probably gets quite heavy, right? Enough to kind of damage something, uh, or at least to kind of uh, uh, startle something. And this is uncomfortable, right? The mouse is dead. That's one of the first signs where we're like, hmm, what's going on with Lenny? A grown man, you know, we, can, we would probably think 20s, you know, maybe early 30s. Uh, a grown man keeping a dead mouse in his pocket uh, just so he can kind of pet it. So, it, you know, it could even speak to, we talk about sensory uh, issues, which could be common in uh, some children with autism or, or adults with autism, sensory issues. It could be that. It, it, again, uh, Steinbeck never comes out clearly to tell us exactly what a diagnosis would be. And for all you young doctors out there, uh, 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 I'm sure uh, you'd be dying to find out, right? So where we move on to next is going to be uh, this kind of topic of poverty, which is almost like the elephant in the room, as the expression goes, the one thing that, though you might want to act like it's not there, it's always there. And, and it is always here. Um, we're talking about poverty. We're talking about deep-seated poverty. We could be talking about generational poverty. I think one thing we have to acknowledge about all the men described in this book, except for Curly, we don't know their fathers. We don't know where they came from. Uh, we don't know their history. It's almost like it's left on purpose to be shrouded, and we don't know because uh, I think it speaks to uh, when we, we are talking about men coming from this station of poverty, there's a lack of support in their lives, right? Family members aren't there to give a, hand, a helping hand. What sets up Curly, who probably is the most antagonistic figure, aside from maybe Lenny, once we kind of really sum things up, um, what can we say of him? He's the only person who has a father. And that father, boy, uh, it's a good father to have. The ranch owner who is clearly the most established, uh, uh, the most materialized in terms of setting the setting. He creates the setting of this novel. He creates the ranch out of his wealth, his own opportunity, right? Perhaps some privilege there we just don't know. Um, but he really is the economic powerhouse of this story. He's what gives rise to the need for these jobs in the first place. But one thing we understand about these men is they, they clearly have nothing. Um, I think what struck me uh, upon going through these pages again was three cans of beans. That's all they have, three cans of beans. Uh, and that's what's going to get them through the night. And you got a big guy like Lenny to feed. George, uh, you gotta, you know, he's got to eat too. Uh, there's only so much. And then you got to just work just to get that next little bit of a, a wage uh, and you keep it going. And then we start to recognize that there might be some problems on top of that. That's on a good day. You work, you get your food. If you can save, that's fantastic. And I think that's a big part of their dream uh, is going to be to save that money. But keep an eye out on George because is he capable of saving that money? Speaking of George, for a quick moment. And I think we stick on this slide of poverty because I think it speaks to what I'm about to discuss here. He's always reminding Lenny of how easy he could have it without him, right? Oh, if I didn't have you, I could eat well, get a girl, uh, keep on working my jobs, no problem. And remember that partially he has a point uh, because it's Lenny getting them into trouble uh, based on his his uh, actions, his, his antics, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's him getting him in trouble. So he is kind of being swept away, driven away uh, from job to job to job, which is creating some instability uh, in his situation. So that's true. But notice the use of language, page seven. Um, the anger, right? 
uh, that we see uh, from George, right? Uh, he says, I could get along so easy and so nice, and uh, if I didn't have you on my tail, I could live so easy and maybe have a girl. That points out one more thing I'll just say quickly is the loneliness in these men's lives. Uh, remember that Curly's wife is the only girl in this whole book, probably because she's the only girl on this ranch, right? So we are talking about lots of men, not a lot of women around, and probably the, the most activity with women we see outside of Curly's wife and what she's involved with is going to be the discussion of cat houses, uh, prostitution, uh, and brothels and things uh, that are in town that they go to spend their money on. Well, isn't that money supposed to be saved for a dream? What's George doing with that money? And I feel like if you're reading this book uh, first time through, you might not be keen on that. You might not be looking for that, but always be noticing what George is doing with whatever money they might be earning here. And remember, it's not just George's money. George takes care of the money for both of them. And that's a big criticism they get as they meet people early in the text is, you guys are running together, are you just taking his money? And George is like, nah, I take care of him, da-da-da-da-da. But what is George doing with the money? Page seven also, they start talking about, we're going to get a job, we're gonna work a little bit more, da-da-da-da-da. Um, this is also at the end where it's kind of blended with the natural kind of scenery and imagery of this kind of paradisial uh, environment, but we do see there, there are some things to worry about. There are some predators, uh, and I think um, one of the big themes uh, kind of connects to a slide uh, coming up here is going to be uh, that idea of predator versus prey. Uh, and some animals are just created in this world to pursue in more aggressive and assertive ways, more domineering ways. And some creatures are, by nature, supposed to be more vulnerable uh, and therefore pursued. Uh, therefore, you know, always on the um, unforgiving si uh, uh, side. Uh, of this conflict, right? And their lives are kind of extinguished in the process. So the predator versus the prey and the characteristics that define each. And we could talk on and on about that and start to get into questions about religion and, and what's the, you know, the whole idea behind religion when it comes to dealing with and kind of mending the predator-prey relationships that exist within this world, at least as far as animals concerned, but the next way more interesting thematic question would be, how does that pertain to ourselves? As human beings, are we the predators? Are we the prey? Are we both? Does it really break down to people? What is Lenny? Predator or prey? What is George? What are some of these other characters if we can start to apply it uh, to these actual people, right? Okay, very good. To uh, uh, move on from this slide here talking about poverty, um, I just want to point out to the, what we have here, a lack of opportunity, right? Um, these men, George and Lenny, and a, you could say a mixture of the others, they, they really don't have opportunity, no opportunity beyond just going from job to job to job, working up a small amount of money, hopefully doing something with that, if not just kind of moving on to the next uh, place. And, and the cycle just continues. The book begins like a cycle, the cycles of life, the cycles of nature, perhaps the cycles of working, right, could be another one. Uh, and so, yeah, um, within that cycle, uh, there's a lack of opportunity, right? And there is something you should all be aware. Uh, this should be just in your brain. It's a term. Generational poverty means not only am I poor, but my parents were poor, my grandparents were poor, my great-grandparents were poor, so on and so forth. So it becomes impossible to build up wealth um, uh, based on conditions. We do find out there's an Aunt Clara. I think when, you know, we find out a little bit about uh, George and Lenny and where Lenny comes from. And there was, he was basically living with an Aunt Clara uh, for a long time. And then she passed away. And that's when... Uh, George basically, not much is said, but he says, I, I kind of took over the responsibility. And the way he puts it really that I remember is uh, he says, he just kind of came out and started working with me. So George was start, starting to go out and just work these kinds of jobs. And then Lenny would follow him uh, every day, right? Um, and I guess you can see that dependency may be growing kind of early, maybe for both of them. Now, uh, we talked about meanness. Uh, page 11 at the bottom, uh, George just keeps, you know, uh, 
prying into uh, Lenny with his, his meanness, right? His, his uh, harsh, aggressive words. I think many of us have been talking to, the, to this way before. We keep in mind that there might be this degree of mental handicap uh, with Lenny, which makes this kind of treatment even more questionable, not to say, uh, you know, George is fully to blame here, uh, how he blows up, but you got to keep that in mind. But we also see George realizing that he's crossed a line. And I'll just read this. What he says to him is, I wished I could put you in a cage with about a million mice and let you have fun. Now, there's a lot of irony in a statement like that. We know that Lenny killed him, uh, um, would probably kill that mouse, right? He might pet it too hard. Um, we see him with the dog. He seems to be better with the dog because it's bigger and it can maybe sustain a bit more of a kind of touch than the mouse. So for him to say that, and I credit Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith at our school for showing me this one day. That's a horrible statement for George to make. Lenny in a cage full of mice, a million mice, what would he do? He would kill them. And it would be like this strangely abstract and, and definitely eerie kind of scene of carnage if Lenny were to be in a cage, much like an animal himself, much like an animal himself, uh, with all of these mice, right? Uh, it would be a horrible scene. And after he says this, I think what the way to interpret it is he's crossed a line in his anger and his meanness, this ability to be mean to, to someone. And I think we're all capable of this, right? This is a part of being a human being, the predator and the prey, right? I think it's all there. Um, and it is a vice. Uh, you could say that for those of us who do this too much to people, it's definitely a concern. It's a vice. It's a problem, right? It's something that maybe it's a part of our personality, the way we treat people, and it should be dealt with, potentially. Um, and what's the accountability of this? Well, that's a question we can keep applying throughout the whole text because you're going to see a lot of, I think, several characters be mean to each other, just genuine meanness, reminding people of their isolation, reminding people of their stupidity when it's already a stigma uh, that plagues their lives, right? That kind of meanness, when you just take the nail and you drive it in even further to what? Make yourself feel better, uh, kind of put you in a certain position. We can all put that in our own words, right? I think that's a pretty relatable thing. Um, and he, I think back to what we have here, page 11. George crosses a line. He quickly realizes it. And I'll read, his anger left him suddenly. After he says that horrible thing, his anger leaves him suddenly. He looked across the fire at Lenny's anguished, right, sad face, despair. And then he looked ashamedly at the flames. So he looks at Lenny and what he's caused there in terms of how he's looking, and he feels ashamed for what he's done. So there is some remorse here uh, early on from George when he seems to cross this line and get tremendously cruel and uh, kind of offensive uh, at Lenny. Okay, very good. Moving into pages uh, 12 and uh, 13, uh, I, I know this isn't lining up perfectly with your uh, with a PDF that I made available uh, for the class, uh, but uh, this is, by my description of these scenes, you should know what I'm talking about. Lenny's way of kind of countering George's, you know, offensive ways, his harsh approach to him, uh, to get a, a, what could be a good point across is to... Uh, basically say, well, I'll just leave. You won't have to worry about me. Is it, is it really just a bluff? Does he really mean that? Would, would Lenny really go off into the hills like an animal again and just kind of live by himself? I don't know. Um, it doesn't really get taken to that point because, you know, uh, the situation's kind of uh, uh, mended here, right? At the bottom of page 12, George uh, says, George looked quickly and searchingly at him. I've been mean, ain't I? And, I, you know, that's where I think you're going to see this word this idea of being mean, I think another good way to put it is mean-spirited, uh, being mean-spirited toward people, and you're gonna see it a lot in these pages. Uh, and it's gonna come from a lot of different characters too, but it's not so cut and dry, and I just wanna uh, end this slide with this idea of accountability. Let's say I'm having a bad day. Let's say I'm having a bad week. I mean, look what we're dealing with right now. Who knows what people are dealing with? Uh, uh, a lot of difficult situations out there. And I'm mean to somebody, or I say something that I probably shouldn't have said. Should I really be to blame? Um, isn't life hard enough where 
I can say whatever I want, right? Because, you know, the test and trials of life. What kind of accountability do we even have with meanness? If my life is in shambles and it's filled with hardship and mean people being mean to me, why can't I be mean to somebody else? And I think the most notable example you'll see of this is when we get into the scene uh, with crooks, right? When Lenny gets into that um, uh, stable, kind of stable home that crooks has put up there and they start to have a little bit of a talk there. And it's mostly a one-sided talk because, you know, Lenny kind of sits there and thinks about the dogs, but at the same time, he is present. And it's a big part of what uh, George uh, Crooks is trying to get across. I think this is when you start to get into, and here I'll go back real quick just to get us thinking about this idea yet again. Friendship, pages uh, 14, probably for you, like pages like seven-ish. Seems to be like half what I have here. Um, George went on with us it ain't like that we got a future we got somebody to talk to that gives a damn about us this is the dream that George shares with Lenny or at least let's say the foundational reason why this dream exists which is we got each other and we will fully support each other most guys don't have anything right they are by themselves and you get plenty of characters who serve as that example, people who are on their own by themselves. And I think the one thing, in a, even in a short novel like this, we feel great about is that George has Lenny and Lenny has George. And even though there is this kind of strangeness between them at times, we are happy they're together for these reasons. And this is highly, you know, commendable speech here, all right, that George is uh, uh, using. We are partners. We are a team, right? And these are uh, uh, obviously valuable sentiments, right? Now, does he really mean it? What is the one card game he plays all the time throughout this uh, book, at least when he's in the, uh, the uh, bunkhouse? Solitaire. What do we know about solitaire? What does the name even mean? By yourself. And he is awfully concerned with that game. There's a careful kind of laying out of cards and he takes his time with that because I think it's challenging what we have here. Here he says to Lenny, and Lenny needs to hear it. Maybe George needs to hear it too. We're a team. We're a team. It's friendship, unbreakable, common goals and dreams. We care about each other. But in the subtle playing of that game and the focus that Steinbeck brings to it, right, as creating this, uh, I think it, it spells out something differently for us. And it's all a precursor to the end of this book. No spoilers. Um, because I won't be covering that in this lecture. Some of the ideas that couple this dream, and here I'll go to uh, some of the, the kind of specifics of this dream for George and Lenny. And again, I think they act as these kind of average Joes, you're kind of uh, a, 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 a standard type of worker, meaning many people share this type of dream, which is to get some land, not have to check in with your boss every day, and, a will, and a, what we would call having some autonomy over your work life. You know, as a teacher, I don't have much. I mean, I do have a lot of autonomy. Uh, as a teacher, part-time professor, I have a lot of autonomy in terms of what I teach, uh, a lot of my approaches to it. But at the same time, I got to, we're doing grade books. Everybody's got this attendance stuff. Everybody's doing this. So you, you have to be uh, kind of on the same page. You have to check in. Uh, my George and Lenny dream of, and maybe some of you out there also dream of, is just not really having to adhere to that type of, you know, checking in, I'm here, this is my boss, da 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 da. Now, their work is very different too uh, when I talk about my life as a teacher. They are, you know, basic work hands uh, on a ranch farming, right? So they're, they're not making that much money. Um, and their dream is to just be able to farm their own stuff. We really call it, uh, I think it's, it's called subsistence, uh, subs subsist subsistence uh, crop um, uh, farming, where you're just essentially growing enough for yourself and maybe a little bit more to sell off at profit, but it's not like you're really trying to make something big of it, right? You're really just trying to sustain yourself uh, uh, and your small kind of, I think we could say uh, humble, uh, kind of uh, humble uh, livelihood, your humble existence. Uh, and it, it, the men are humble. Um, I'll get to this probably at some point, but just to mention it right now, I think it's Candy who, when he starts to think about the dream more and more, and he, he actually starts to visualize it in his mind, he gets a little, um, he's like, 
getting excited, but he calms himself down because he's not used to even dreaming that big. Uh, so when we think about opportunity and what's been available to these men, um, this, you know, this really isn't it. This would be something very new for them. Owning your own land, being your own boss. Teamwork, the teamwork that's gonna make that possible because they can't do this on their own. Lack of funds, lack of ability. George and Lenny are young. We talk about Candy later coming on board to join up in this alliance. Uh, and they're all needed. Notice that Candy's old, so he has to almost you know, encourage them to take him on. He says, you know, I know I don't look like much, but I got the money, that's one thing I got, and I can do little things around, and I'll, you know, I'll do my, my, my bit. All Lenny can really talk about is the rabbits, the rabbits, the rabbits. Living off the fat of the land, what the land will give you, what the land will produce for you. I love this line. This is the bottom of my page 14, probably around seven, eight in the PDF. George is talking. I get excited when I read this because it's all so ideal, idealistic. I right? think about how good it could be. And it's still kind of a humble slice of the American dream. He's not asking for much. He's not asking to have a Fortune 500 company or you know stocks and bonds and stuff like that. He's asking for just a little bit of land so he can kind of live his life. And he says, and when it rains in the winter, we'll just say the hell with going to work. And we'll build up a fire in the stove and set around it and listen to the rain coming down on the roof. Nuts. And he says, nuts. Imagine not having to be forced out there to work in the rain just to earn some money that mainly goes to uh, the ranch owner, the farmer, the, uh, the, the farm owner uh, who is employing you. And he says, nuts, because it's unimaginable, right? The life they leave, the life they lead, we're reading it, right? It is working and staying in these bunk houses and not having a lot of money and doing things with that money. Uh, we'll get more on that later. Uh, we end uh, that first chapter with George just reminding Lenny, this is where we're going to meet up uh, if uh, we uh, have some problems at, at this ranch we're going to, right? Another thing to keep in mind uh, as we move into the next uh, chapter here is that they were supposed to go all the way through, get off that train, bus, wherever they came from, and then just go all, you know, walk it all the way to the ranch and get to the ranch so that they could start working the next uh, uh, you know, the next morning, right? Bright and early. What George wants to do instead, it's a part of his characterization, so we have to take it into account, is he says, now nah, we're just going to sleep here the night, go there kind of in the morning-ish, afternoon-ish tomorrow, and purposefully miss, uh, purposefully miss uh, the, uh, purposefully miss uh, the uh, uh, time to be there. It doesn't take long uh, for us to run into some of the more controversial uh, kind of topics, uh, the, the controversial treatment we find uh, of some characters. And it comes through this kind of exposition as characters start to talk about crooks and, and a, a situation that crooks was caught up in. And I think this ends, to be, ends up being highly symbolic, which for us is very important because we can take this symbolism and uh, keep applying it. Uh, as we as we continue to read, so uh, Candy is kind of describing uh, Crooks, uh, the stable uh, hand. Now the ironic thing about Crooks is he's an African American, so even though we're in California and it is a better place for black people to be, and in fact he talks about his uh, his childhood and he played with white kids, even though his dad was like, "What are you doing?" Um, but it wasn't like say growing up in the South where those that racism takes on different sentiments, different forms, right? Um, it, it is different in California, but it's still prevalent, especially when we consider the time period, right? Thank goodness we're in 2020. Times are better, uh, it seems, in, in many regards, compared to what we get in this book, right? So Crooks is black. However, let's not forget, he's one of the few people at this ranch that has a permanent place. Uh, they say it's due to his handicap. He's kind of given special treatment. I think that speaks well. If uh, my, my kind of judgment on it would be that speaks well to the ranch owner that he would express that kind of mercy here he seems to do it with candy as well uh, and and gives these men a more permanent place uh, despite the fact that they're aging and 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 it almost seems uh, and I can kind of clue us into a very quick theme here this idea of uh, euthanasia and mercy killing uh, the first time this will come to us is of course when we talk about candy's dog here but before we get there um, what I want to focus on firstly is uh, the 
story that's given about this white guy named Smitty who beats up uh, who beats up Crooks. And because Crooks is disabled, like his back is kind of bent, it's one of those names that you give to somebody based on maybe your appearance and somebody gives you the name, right? It just kind of defines you. So Smitty is a white guy and to even out the fight with this black man, Crooks, who's got a bad back, uh, he gets on his knees, right? To kind of even the playing field there. <coughs> now the name's Smitty. We start to get into um, one of the uh, clear symbolisms of the piece, which is of course gonna be Candy's dog. Uh, and it's old, just like Candy. Just like Crooks in many respects too. And the word here uh, that you can kind of hang a hat on is lame. Uh, and you know that name, that that word itself has a lot of different implications: uh, the disabled, uh, 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 the weak, uh, the the downtrodden, right? So there, there's lots of different people you could say fall into that category. Uh, in this uh, case, it, it definitely seems to be the old and the purposeless, especially when it comes to physical labor. Um, we understand that the human body wears down over time, and so it can't really uh, contribute uh, much. And so that's where we get into this idea of euthanasia. Uh, it starts with the dog. It's old, it's smelly, it's probably got some diseases kind of riddling its body. And what uh, Carlson is going to say, who is always described as kind of, you know, you know, broad chested and kind of a, you know, capable, a man in his 20s, 30s who was completely capable. The body kind of speaks for itself, especially when compared to, to Candy. Uh, and so he says, and, and it makes sense that it would be him based on the way he's described, this dog's had its day. Uh, it will be happier. And that's where we get into this idea of calling this mercy killing. When we take our dogs and cats or whatever uh, other animals and they, they're, 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 uh, having a very hard time uh, clearly and so we inject them in this case they will shoot the dog in the back of the head he knows where to do it so that there is no pain uh, interesting uh, the way you put the bullet right in the back of the head right just so that there's no pain that's an interesting uh, detail that's provided here Curly has his first run-in with Lenny and Lenny for the most part handles himself quite well Curly and that smite and that aggression, uh, that kind of meanness that we talked about. Um, he likes to pick on guys who are bigger than him. And if he loses, well then, he could say the guy was bigger than me. And if he wins, he could say, look at that. I did real good because the guy was bigger than me. So he really can't lose in a way, uh, is the way it's described. He's a very cocky guy. Uh, he's got a lot of, uh, uh, he likes to brag a lot about him himself. Uh, he is recently married, and that's where we have Curly's wife, right? Curly's wife seems to be a bit of a flirt. Uh, and again, on an environment like this, uh, you know, there's going to be many single, probably even desperate men to flirt with. And she seems to kind of put that, uh, uh, definitely give men attention uh, throughout. I wouldn't say it's an uh, uh, unfounded uh, claim that she likes to flirt with other men. In these pages of this chapter 2, this is kind of getting toward uh, probably around uh, pages uh, 10 through 14. Uh, this is where uh, George is starting to lay out that solitaire hand because it represents, him, you know, again, uh, his path of singularity. Uh, the fact that maybe he would be better off with Lenny uh, without uh, Lenny by his side and having to worry about that burden and that trouble and that, uh, that excessive responsibility uh, that Lenny may be. Now we know also there's good things that come with Lenny too. A friendship, a bond, someone to talk to. And those themes will be uh, given to us uh, in just a little bit. We were talking about Curly's wife a moment ago, uh, even Slim seems to kind of flirt with her and there'll be uh, more of a buildup uh, to that uh, conflict later on where Curly uh, actually confronts Slim and says, hey, my, what are you doing with my wife? You and my wife getting a little too close? Now, one thing that is quite noticeable uh, is Lenny's discomfort. Uh, with Curly in that whole scene and getting, you know, aggressively kind of put on the spot there for not doing anything. Uh, let's remember he hasn't done a single thing to this guy, right, for him to uh, 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 be this aggressive toward him. And 
Lenny says, you know, I don't want to be here. Uh, and he says, it's mean here. And there's that word. I think that's a, it's a crucial uh, piece of diction for us. It's mean here, right? Uh, there's all, you know, there's vice here. Accountability we talk about as we get into the different characters here. And he's experienced uh, a very directed meanness from Curly, right? Right in his face. But George says shortly, shortly, like no question to it. Doesn't even take anything that Lenny requests there into consideration. He says, we got to stay, shut up now. The guys will be coming in. And I think once you understand the full trajectory of the plot of this book uh, and where it's headed, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a death sentence, uh, I think we'll see, uh, for uh, Lenny. He's asking to leave. He knows this is going to be a problem. And George says, nope, got to stay. Doesn't really give it a second thought. We talk about Slim in this uh, story. Uh, and it's hard not to start talking about this idea of moral leadership. Who's going to provide that moral and ethical leadership in this book? And I think the reason why Slim really kind of is, is first and foremost uh, in my mind is because he's just given a lot of description when it comes to these types of moments. Uh, when it comes to Candy's dog and the decision to put the dog down, Slim is very much involved. In fact, he's the one that everybody defers to. They say, should we do this? And everybody looks to Slim and Slim's like, and they say, time to do it, right? So everything goes to Slim. It's almost in a, kind of a godlike judgment, uh, I think, that he has here um, because everybody is tied to his judgment uh, so strongly, right? Uh, including Candy, uh, the person who's going to have to give up the dog in the first place. Now, that may or may not be the case for you, uh, if that's the way you're thinking about Slim. Um, but... What he does say is okay is to euthanize the dog here, right? To actually put it down out of its misery. And here we have uh, a mercy killing uh, that's being okayed by essentially somebody who might be one of the moral leaders of the play. So uh, it's hard to say what those morals and ethics are. I think there's a big gray area to what is right and what is wrong. I think that's one of the main complications and, and therefore kind of good themes about this book. Uh, so I think it's tough to say, but in a way he is definitely advocating in some kind of way, uh, moral or ethically, uh, for uh, this, uh, the, the putting down of this dog. Now with the passing of that dog, we talk about the cycle of life, things always kind of, you know, uh, 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 returning only to kind of exist again, return, exist again. Just as we have Candy's dog eventually being pushed down, we also have the birth of new puppies. And with these puppies, we have the eagerness of Lenny uh, to get his hands on those puppies. We also see the snuffing out of life of some of these puppies, uh, where the reason Slim says I killed them. So not only does he okay the euthanasia of uh, uh, Candy's dog, he's already killed puppies at the beginning of their life where there is thematically so much potential for these young pups. His reason being that mom can't support all those, those puppies. So these three puppies, I think it was three, they're being drowned right off the bat. He drowned these puppies and that's euthanasia. It's not really putting those puppies out of its misery, but in a way it's taking some kind of objective approach to making it easier on that mother. Just like if George were to cut out Lenny from his life, it would make his existence perhaps easier, right? So there is definitely that nice uh, uh, correspondence here that we have. And we're talking about animals and we're talking about people because in a way we're talking about one and the same. It's the same thing. Okay, uh, that's where I'll end uh, pages, uh, the first, uh, at page 40 for me. That's going to be the first two chapters here, and then I can put a lecture together for the next couple uh, next time. All right, have a very nice day.